can we agree that between like 8 p.m., for example, or 7 p.m. or 6 p.m., you pick the time, and 6 a.m. the next morning or 8 a.m. the next morning, we are not going to check our email. And if there's something that cannot wait until the morning, we call each other. Because if things come up, we need a way to reach each other. And maybe you align on new edges that everybody aligns on, everybody agrees to, and then just make it a group habit change. Hold each other accountable. Make sure you spend your time on you, not on a screen activity. Don't use your you time for Facebook. Welcome to the HR L&D podcast with your host, Nick Day, CEO and founder of JGA Recruitment, specialist HR recruiters. Tuning into the HR L&D podcast will help you to discover strategic growth concepts, leadership development strategies, and the values and behaviors that drive organizational change and success. Together, let's empower our workforces, diversify our thinking, and achieve significant HR success. Hello, and welcome back to the HR L&D podcast. Today, I'm joined on the HR L&D show by organizing and productivity expert, Julie Morgenstern. Now, she's founder of Julie Morgenstern Enterprises. She's also a New York Times best-selling author of not just one, but a number of books, including Organizing from the Inside Out. Now, they all aim to help everyone to organize their lives more effectively. In fact, for over 30 years, Julie has been teaching people all around the globe at all stages of life about how they can help overcome their disorganization to achieve their goals. So I'm really excited about this conversation. It's certainly something that I could benefit from 100%. Now, as we watch companies transition back into the office in this new world of work post-pandemic, it's been a lot of new ways of working. Hiring managers and HR leaders are being forced to navigate new obstacles created by this pandemic. And it's, there's a lot of things to consider from preventing employee burnout to finding new ways to re-engage workforces. I think Judy could give us a huge amount of insight in how we can manage our days and prioritization and our productivity more effectively as a result. Now to give you a very, very quick background to Julie. She, uh, her expertise rather, has been shared on countless TV and radio shows, include, including the Oprah Winfrey Show, CNN, The Today Show, and The Good Morning America. She's been quoted and featured in publications including Forbes, Cosmopolitan, Time Magazine, The New York Times, and many, many more besides. So with that in mind, I'm hoping today Julie can help us all to tame the chaos that's unfolding all around us in this new world of work, Judy, welcome to the HR l and podcast. It's a delight to have you on the show. Oh, it's great to be here with you. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, my absolute pleasure. So I'd love to dive straight in if we can. I wondered if you could just tell us, just to contextualize your experience for the audience, a little bit about your journey that's led you to the podcast today. Because I understand from my research that you used to be a notoriously disorganized person living in a constant state of of chaos as you put it you said yeah. that you are a classic right brain creative type operating out of piles spending your day searching for things losing things in fact you even lost someone's car once so have you gone from scrambling around forgetting things to becoming an, uh, an organizing and productivity expert yeah thank you for that so uh, yes i i did grow up very right brain very i still am very right brain and very creative but when i was younger i d could not organize my way out of a paper bag i really like lived in piles uh, my parents when i was younger would ban me to my uh bedroom once every three months and with the instructions on a friday night that i couldn't come out until there was a clear path from the door to my bed Wow. <laughs> so what happened for me was I really wanted to get organized. I really craved order, but I could not figure out how to do it, no matter how hard I tried. And then I had a baby. And there was something about having a baby where I felt like, listen, I, as chaotic as I was, I always pulled things off at the last minute. I always got straight A's. Like I, I always did it. But I thought, I could not impose this form of chaos on an innocent child. And I was very motivated to get organized. What I was afraid of, honestly, was that getting organized was gonna make me boring. That I love the spontaneity. I love the like, you know, figuring things out on the fly. 
And I thought, I, you know, if I get organized, I'm going to be so structured and so predictable and it's going to be so boring. And that was my resistance. But when you have a kid, I was like, this kid has to get to nursery school. She has to get to, I have to fill out the forms. I have to get her to the doctor. So I was willing to be boring to be a good parent. What ended up happening was I realized once I started to learn to get organized, it doesn't squelch your creativity, it fuels it. It gives you so much more time and energy and focus that's otherwise wasted in a panic or you know, looking for things. So my own epiphany of like, wow, you can be organized and creative was so profound to me that when I, my, I got divorced when my daughter was three and I couldn't really afford theater hours or money anymore. So I thought I can help people get organized. And I started the business and it instantly took off. And I think it's been so successful for so long because I really understand what it feels like to be chaotic and crave order. I walked over that bridge myself. So I am very empathetic. I really understand the dual pools. I understand that it's a combination of psychology, like mindset and mechanics that help you change. It's not just mechanics. When I was younger and I would hear like, oh, you know, a place for everything and everything in its place, or just, you know, be disciplined. And it used to like, it turned me off to organizing. It sounded so rigid. And I've learned it's really mindset. You have to sort of change the way you think of something. And then all of a sudden you can add a mechanic and boom, you change. So I think that's why it's been so successful is my empathy and my real insight into what it feels like to be creative or resistant to order, but also want it. And your experience has been incredibly successful. I mean, there's a number of books, and we'll talk about those a little bit later on. But I think as my introduction highlighted, your inside-out philosophy has been quoted and referenced by some of the world's most renowned publications and TV shows. And you've outlined your, I guess, your intuitive approaches to building systems into daily life that can help, as you put it, anyone. So it's about who you are, whether you are senior C-suite, whether you are, you know, it doesn't matter anyone to achieve their goals at home, if you're a parent, at school, if it's children, um, and at work, of course, which is really relevant for the HR leaders that are listening to this podcast. Tell us a little bit more about that inside-out system and why it's so applicable to everybody. So I think that in order to design any system for your time, for your space, for your projects, for your teams, in order to make it sustainable, you have to design it based on the very unique goals and natural habits of the person or the team. Like if you think about companies, every company has a culture of time that's a little different than the next one. There's a culture of time. I talk about that, right? Every entity is like a personality. It has its goals. It has its way of working. And you need to sort of honor and respect and then shape that from the inside out, not just come in and say, Listen, there's one way to run a meeting. Every schedule should only have three things on it every day. Devil be damned. Like, it doesn't work that way. So Inside Out is about designing systems that honor who you are, how you think, what is important to you, and that there's really no cookie cutter system that works for everybody. And there's a process, there's a cookie cutter process that gets you to a customized result. That's what I was able to design. It's like, if you follow these steps, you analyze the situation, you strategize, what are we going to do? What's the solution? And then you attack, you then put it into place. That cookie cutter process will lead you to a customized solution that is sustainable. And it's very powerful to watch because how we spend our time is really how we spend our lives. And so it's a very tender subject for people when you're talking to them about how they're spending their time. And they can feel defensive. They can feel bad about themselves. They can feel like, oh my God, I'm such a failure. I'm so embarrassed. I'm so... And that will shut somebody down from being able to like learn or change, right? So you have to go in with respect. And when people feel that understood respected for the way they think and whatever's getting in the way, they'll follow you. And so 
I love the stories of people who are like, oh my God, I tried for so many years and then I tried that method or I, we worked from the inside out and breakthrough. It's very powerful and being organized with your time, with your schedule, the way you work with others, which is the corporate side, which is a whole nother level I'd love to talk to you about a little bit more about, but getting that gives you a sense of control and control gives you energy. Control gives you mental clarity, right? And the opposite has the opposite effect. When we feel out of control, we can't think clearly, we waste time, we feel like we're not, we're de-energized. So it's a very powerful, practical tool that can get people energized, engaged, focused, and feel a great sense of accomplishment. It's interesting because um, I've just finished reading uh, Never Split the Difference by Chris Voss, who's an FBI negotiator. And it sounds like a lot of things you're talking about at the moment relate to negotiating, all, albeit potentially with ourselves, that, to, to get to that end of the process. And he talks a lot about autonomy. And when you take autonomy away, you take control away. So to give yourself that power back, which you mentioned there, allows mm -hmm. us to put us on the right path. And from a recruitment perspective, which which I know very well, bringing it back into that corporate context, most people work really, really hard in order not necessarily to earn better wealth, but to earn more time. And wealth sometimes is an enabler to get give you that time back, whether it's early retirement or something else. But that time is kind of more precious than anything else that we have. And most people would say, actually, it'd be great to have that money. That's great. But it's time I want with my children, time I want with my parents. And it's so critical. And yet I'm a walking example of someone who's pretty disorganized. I'm, I'm always leaving wallets in front of cars. And, and only last yeah. week, uh, I left my wallet in the middle of the road and, and a kind lady managed to find it. I dropped it and didn't know, didn't know it was missing until about eight hours later. And she picked it up and handed it in for me. So why is it then when people like myself, I really want more time. I, I work really hard to get more time for my family. And yet I can't really get out of that process of being disorganized and forgetful. What's the starting process for someone like me as a leader, as someone who is managing teams and, 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 and you know, working at C-suite level, if you like, how yeah. can I make that step change? So the first thing to me to take control of your time, which feels so slippery and slips through your fingers, you have all these to-dos on your to-do list and it's all of a sudden the end of the day and you're like, I didn't even look at my list and I've been busy all day. What happened? So I think the single biggest obstacle to managing our time well lies in our perception of time. It's our perception of time. So we think of time as relative, as somewhat stretchy. You know, how long is an hour? It depends on what you're doing, right? If you're with friends or your kid or you're having fun, it feels like five minutes. If you're sitting in the dentist chair, it feels like, you know, half a day. And it's and typically easier to organize space than time, even for the most disorganized person, right? And I see you nodding your head. Why? What is it about space that's easier <laughs> to organize, do you think? What do you think? I, I, I can only assume based on what you said there, it's due to more of a conceptual awareness of it you know you know your spaces I know where things sit and I guess there's a certain degree of organization within that although my wife would tell you I'm disorganized in spaces as well as I am with my time but fair enough I in my own journey <laughs> learning to get organized I got space way before time and I started out very disorganized physically I think the thing about physical space is it's tangible it's visual you can see it you can hold it in your hands you can measure it as you said but time is invisible so my own journey of learning to get organized, and I did get space way before time. I had a aha one day and I was like, wait a minute, organizing time is exactly like organizing space. I want you to picture a disorganized closet. It is a limited space that is crammed with way more stuff than you can possibly fit. And items are shoved into any available pocket of space in no particular order. And that haphazard arrangement makes it impossible to know what's in there. So you keep buying the same pair of black jeans because you're like, what do I need? I probably need another pair of black jeans. <laughs> you have like 17 pairs of black jeans, but no khakis, no, you know, you get very out of balance because it's so chaotic. I want you to picture a disorganized day. A disorganized day is a limited amount of time that is crammed with way more things than you can possibly fit and those tasks are shoved into any available pocket of time in no particular order. 
you sit down and you're going to work on the blog and then you think, oh my God, I forgot to file those receipts. And so you stop and you do that. And then you're like, somebody calls and says, hey, do you have a minute? You don't know when you're going to have a minute. So you say, sure. Even though you don't, you shove it in, you start shoving things into any available pocket of time in no particular order. And that haphazard arrangement makes it almost impossible for you to keep track of the balance of your time between your various responsibilities, between your work and your personal life, between the proactive and the reactive. It's fragmented. You feel fragmented. Because, you know, what is a disorder? It's 24 hours. Take away eight hours of sleep. What do you have left? Say you're willing to work 10 hours a day. If you're even willing to work 10 hours a day, but you're trying to shove 18 hours worth of stuff in it, you're going to work hard and feel a terrible sense of disaccomplishment at the end of the day yeah. because you've set yourself up to be frustrated. But if you have 10 hours and you plan 10 hours of stuff, you're going to end that day feeling victorious with the same activity. So the visual metaphor helps so much. And once you realize time is not infinite, it's not stretchy, it's right. just the container. It's only going to fit so much. You figure out how many hours do I want to work? How many hours do I want for leisure? How many time hours do I want for me? What do I want for my family? And you create what I call a time map. And you it's like a, organize the closet of your week and you give everything a home. And then you learn to be really efficient within each bucket. Absolutely love that. I feel like I'm having, I'm hoping my listeners, I'm sure, but many of them will be the same. I feel like it's a one-to-one -one therapy session here, helping <laughs> you get my life better in order. I'm actually like that. I always think of being on a plane. If you go to a six-hour flight, it takes forever, but a six-hour workday is gone in a flash. And yeah. I'm, I'm definitely one of these people that's got to-do lists coming out my ears, and I do tend to get pulled aside. So I'll take some of that in. I think something from a, if we bring it back to the HR leaders listening to this, and certainly the new world of work, yeah. one thing that yeah. I've identified with myself, uh, certainly since the pandemic, and I'm sure there are many others feeling like this now that they're working from home more than they ever did before, is a fear of logging off. I think it's been known as FOLO, so it's not just me that's suffering this, but it's um, you know fear of logging off from work, and that's obviously got to have an impact on, on mental health and have an impact on family time. How are you seeing that? Has that got worse post-pandemic? Am I just a, a random case, or is this, have you seen a real rise in... in, in FOLO, as, as I'm calling it, uh, fear of logging off post-pandemic. Yeah, 100%. FOLO is real, uh, fear of logging off. And I would say that we were struggling with our fear of logging off or what I would call our screen addiction pre-pandemic, no doubt. Our screens are very addictive. They, you know, it's like an instant response. We have something to think about. We go to our screens instead. Who's, you know, so we were struggling with, screen time pre-pandemic, but the pandemic with everybody suddenly forced to work from home and being separated and not being able to see each other or know what was going on, created, exacerbated, accelerated, accentuated uh, our, that addiction to the screens. And we have developed a true fear of logging off through the pandemic. People are just so afraid to step away from their computer for even a half an hour in the middle of the day to eat or take a bio break. And at the end of the day, they, they were home. So companies have to be, and HR leaders have to be super aware this is a real phenomenon, but it hurts you. It hurts you as an employer if your people are never feeling safe to separate from the screen because somebody might send an email and they may miss it or not be part of the conversation or be perceived as not really working, right? So the individual has to fight it and the employers have to fight it. And I would say that it's a habit of the pandemic that people have not consciously uh, identified, whoa, that developed and I have to break that and I have to work with my team and we have to give each other permission to be offline for how long and when, when are we on and when are we off and how do we reach each other in between. I was just talking to a client yesterday who's a chief people officer for a big global corporation and she said they're really struggling with this and yeah. um, and she even she like you know she said like the CEO 
is like sending emails at 11 o'clock at night still. And she feels bad not answering because it makes her look like a slacker. And he's unconsciously just, you know, fell into really bad 24 seven habits. And that's what I was saying about the culture of time. It's, it, it, it builds up by the way, very often the way leaders, leaders set it, the, the culture without even being aware. They're just trying to get their work done in their own work style. And they think they're in a bubble. You're not in a bubble when it comes to time. Time is a communal resource in a company. And how each person behaves affects everybody else. So the leaders have to really recognize the incredible power they have consciously or not, to create the edges, to create the good work habits or the bad work habits by their own habits. And and it's very fixable, but it requires consciousness. And FOLO is a very big problem right now. Yeah, I'm I'm definitely witnessing it. It's interesting. I think my team would say it's definitely something that I struggle with. And I know for many people, you mentioned the potentially it's the trust issue. People stay on longer because they want to be seen, not to be slacking. I definitely think that's part of it. I'm not reporting upwards. I'm founder of my own company, but I still can't log off, as you say, in case that email comes in. I always want to be connected. But as a productivity expert, something I'm quite interested in, and another a previous guest I had on the show, a guy called Graham Ravenscroft, talked about the importance of recovery. And one of the things about having a fear of logging off is you have less time to recover. And if you look at Formula One teams, they have a pit stop. That's the chance for a car to recover and the teams to recover. If you look at athletes in their training schedules, they'll train really hard. But each week or every other week, they'll have a week or a couple of days to recover. And I'm wondering, particularly with the leaders I know that listen to this podcast and the people that I speak to regularly, I think there's a real lack of recovery time built into a working day or professional working week. Certainly I struggle with this. And yeah. there's a there's also an element of I feel guilty for booking in recovery time because I could be working. And I think that's a real issue that people have to overcome as well. But yeah. from your perspective as a productivity expert, what you know, have you seen the benefits of what recovery time can really have or even reverse engineer it, what the ramifications could be if we don't build in recovery? Hundred percent. I've seen it over and over. So there's a lot of studies. There's a huge study that was done by Stanford University, I believe, that measured productivity over uh, uh, the number of hours people put in. And they found that when you, anybody working over 50 hours, once you get over 50 hours, your productivity drops like by 40%. Once you work over 55 hours, your productivity drops so intensely that if you worked, for example, 70 hours, that extra 15 hours is worth like 45 minutes of productivity. It's useless. Wow. Wow. So we have to recognize that working longer does not make you smarter or more efficient or more innovative or more effective or achieve anything. But it feels when you are at the end of your 50-hour workday and there's so much to do, you feel like, well, if I just did a few more things, you have to break the mindset. I think of it kind of like we're like cell phone charger, like we're a cell phone. You run out of battery, you have to go and recharge. You have to plug yourself in. And the way to do that is to really cut off and do, you, you're calling it recovery, which I think is a great word. I call it renewal. We need to renew, renew, renew the energy. And there's so many stories. I, I, I have to be selective here and, and pick one. Uh, so you talk about the impact and the ramifications. I work with a client, coached an uh, executive, senior executive, woman leader, who's so high achieving and uh, would work 60, 70 hour weeks. And Never really got to the bottom of the to-do list, but at 70 hours, she was like, okay, that's it. (laughs) I've done as much as I, (laughs) right? It's a random number. She was so down in the weeds. She could not see the forest for the trees. Instead of staying in the high level strategic thinking, she was getting down into like micro managing her teams, micro managing documents. Like she felt so buried by the work and her teams found her to be short-tempered, inaccessible. They could never reach her because she was just always so busy. 
And I, it took me a while of coaching her to get her to first invest in sleep. She was only sleeping three or four hours a night because you can imagine if you work 70 hours, like you need some transition before you can fall asleep. So we worked on her sleep. I said, I'm not, I don't wanna give you any more time management tips for your work day. We're gonna work on your recovery time. So we worked on sleep. We got her to go from four hours sleep a night to seven. We got her to end her workday and disconnect while she was with her family for dinner and doing some self-renewal like activity in the evening, whether that was like reading a book or listening to music, something that was for her, not giving to others. And she ended up working less hours, but suddenly seeing the forest for the trees. She was so strategic all of a sudden. She was starting to look ahead. What can we do with clients? She was innovating. She was leading her teams. The whole tenor of her teams, people started loving working for her, you know, and enjoyed because she was able to guide and coach, et cetera. So she became more effective by working less hours. A better leader, a smarter consultant, efficient and, and, and spent her time on the highest and best use of her time. She could see what was the highest, best use of her time. And it was a marvel to witness that transformation because she was very resistant. Right, it took amazing. me a while because yeah. <laughs> she, she hung on to the way she worked yeah, she because did. she thought she was successful that way. But she now, I know there's no, there's no quick fix, but what are the um, most common objections that you must hear and certainly that we hear is, well, I just don't have time. Is there a quick or was there an immediate response to that, to that, you know, builds within you when you hear that initial objection from, you know, certainly from HR leaders, we'll hear all the time, Nick, I'd love to do X, Y, and Z. But I just don't have time. I'd love to make this transformation or, or look at my hiring strategy, as you say, or, or get into that blue sky thinking, but I just don't have time. What's, what's the immediate sort of response to that that creates inside you when you hear that first objection? Well, I mean, I, I know it really feels that way and the way you're operating, you don't have time. But you're also operating, I think everybody who's working that hard would agree they're not operating efficiently. They're down no. in the weeds, they're putting out fires, they don't have time for the proactive. So you have to kind of take a risk strategically, smartly, and jump ahead to start opening up time and brain space. Remember, time management is really uh, the process of managing your energy and your brain power for peak performance in everything you do. It's about energy and brain power. So what you do and when matters. And if there were three things that I would say to anybody who just feels like, I, are you kidding me? Like, I don't have time. Where do you get a little bit of bandwidth? I would say the hardest is to stop checking your, this is the hardest, I'm gonna start with the hardest, is to really fight your screen addiction. and. Yeah. You can't, it's not an overnight process, but maybe set times that you're going to, regular times you're going to process your email and do not check mindlessly in the little cracks in your schedule or when you get bored. Just say, I'm going to at 9 and 11 and 1 or even 9 and 10 and 11 and 12 and set your phone alarm for your 10 minute email checks and don't check it in between because that's the first place to start gaining space is to break that mindless screen addiction. I always tell people build in a minimum of two 20 minute or less renewal activities into your day, one toward the morning and one toward the end of the day. On the edges, this is in your personal time, a 20 minute or a 10 minute workout, 10 minutes of listening to music at the end of the day, break away from the chaos and build in two daily anchors that are step away from all the chaos and are joyful things for you. I think everybody can agree that they waste at least <laughs> two 10 or 20 minute blocks a day sure. to mindless, right? You're wasting it. Invest that in stepping away and doing two things that you will, will ground you. And that gives you self-care during the day that is not just sleep is your only form of self-care. It suddenly, as I mentioned with my client, it gives you perspective on some of the things that you're spending your time on that are actually a waste of time. But if you stay buried, you can't see 
what's important and what's not. It all looks the same. So I would start with that. Maybe just start with that. I know that the email addiction is so hard. And if you're going to change your schedule, we talked about FOLO. I would talk with your team and your direct reports and your boss and say, look, we've all gotten into this 24-7. It got us through the pandemic, but it's not sustainable. Can we agree that between like 8 p.m., for example, or 7 p.m. or 6 p.m., you pick the time, and 6 a.m. the next morning or 8 a.m. the next morning, we are not going to check our email. And if there's something that cannot wait until the morning, we call each other. Because if things come up, we need a way to reach each other. And maybe you align on new edges that everybody aligns on, everybody agrees to, and then just make it a group habit change, hold each other accountable. Make sure you spend your time on you, not on a screen activity. Don't use your you time for Facebook. Have you ever asked yourself, how can any recruiter understand my HR recruitment challenges? please don't give up on your hiring challenges just yet. Here at JGA HR Recruitment, we appreciate the difficulties associated with attracting, recruiting and retaining top human resources talent. We also understand just how costly a poor hire can be. JGA HR Recruitment would like to partner with you to help you overcome your hiring challenges. Contact us today on 01727 800 377 or visit jgarecruitment.com to find out more. No, no, of course. I think you hit the nail on the head with the, the word habit. I think a lot of the screen activities and the emails, it's, it, we've, it's become habit forming. It's a natural thing we do. We wake up in the morning, we reach for our phones, or you finish work, you reach for your phones. And um, you know, you, it's that, there's that comic sketch where a beep goes and everyone's, everyone gets their phone out at the same time to check if it's them, right? It's that, that fear of missing out as well, the FOMO as well as the photo of, is, is it for me, is it not? And we can break those habits, but it's not easy. It takes, takes a little bit of time. One thing I was really fascinated about, and, I, and I, especially as you've written a whole book dedicated to the subject, and I wasn't going to raise it at this part of the podcast, but you mentioned it um, there as one of the habit changes, is you wrote a whole book dedicated, another best-selling book on do not check your emails in the morning. So tell me a bit about the research behind behind that that and why if we turn off from that habit, it can be so effective. So never check email in the morning is, uh, you know, it's a strategy that um, and a technique that I have found really helps people shift from a totally reactive mode to proactive, to feeling like they are in, fr- being controlled by technology, to feeling like they are in control back to in control. And, you know, the reality is, I mean, depending on your job, you may not be able to not check all morning, but your first start with your first hour of the day. There is nothing, even in a global workplace, your first hour of the morning should not be, let me see what's going on out there. Because it it turns you like your brain into the the reactive mode And then it's very hard to shut it down and then get proactive. Everybody wants, craves, this is a universal cry within the workplace. People don't have time to think. They feel they don't have time to think, to innovate, to strategize, to problem solve. Everything is very staccato, quick, 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 quick. They need time for legato work, right? Which is like an hour or two, sometimes three, of pure uninterrupted time to go deep on learning, thinking, process innovation, strategy, writing. You should use the first hour of your workday for your highest impact legato work. If you reclaim your first working hour for that, first of all, an hour feels like two. Your brain is fresh. You just go in, there's no distractions. And then you start your day with you in control And you've done the proactive thing that's going to reduce the number of fires. It's going to solve big problems. It'll save time in the long run. It's so powerful. And then you can roll your shades up for business and find out what everybody needs. That's That's definitely going to be adopting that. I'm going to give that a try from tomorrow onwards. I'll make that that step change from this podcast right here, right now. And hopefully the listeners will be doing the same. From tomorrow, first hour, no email checking. No email. To help you with that habit change, Decide what you're going to do instead, because I have found in breaking the tether from email, the draw, that gravitational pull, 
it's much easier to combat the gravitational pull when you have something, a concrete alternative. If it's just don't check your email and find something else to do, you're like, nah, I'm just going to check my email. <laughs> but, <laughs> but if it's, I'm going to like spend an hour, you know, doing the first draft of my blog or reading last year's, you know, board report to find out what our promises were, then it's, do I check my email? Or do I get that deliverable done? And it's much easier to combat reactive with a concrete proactive task. Well, to be fair, I've got a project that's been on my to-do list. I have to-do list pads and it's been on there for about two weeks and I've never got to it because you know, it needs to be done. So I'm going to go straight into that task tomorrow. Sure so thing. right now I get on. Yeah. Get done first now. Good. So for HR leaders as well, what else can companies do to really seize the moment and create more of a, a real-time culture inside their organizations? So the time culture, and I, as I said, every company, and I learned this as a productivity trainer, teacher, coach over the years, you can teach individuals all the time management techniques in the world. But if they're working in an environment that is working against their ability to apply those, that's a time culture, right? So if you want to encourage your people to spend more time proactively thinking, then what is the protocol and the expectations around email or Slack or instant messaging? Are people, if they don't respond in five minutes, getting hounded? Is that the culture? You have to change that culture, right? So as we are going back to the workplace and going forward into recreating for the first time in a hundred years, what work looks like, it's an extraordinary opportunity. I think there's a few levers for leaders to think about. Obviously there's where you work, which we're talking about. Do you work at home? Do you work in the office? And when you do each, what's the value? What's the value of getting people together? What's the value of working from home? What kind of work is best for each environment? So there's the where you work and the when you work, that sort of control that you can give people or some options. But I think what is your values and philosophy around renewal time? This is a moment for companies to rethink and articulate what is Do we have the same values before, which is we don't really care about your personal life. Just get the work done. This is a competitive race and, you know, work till you drop and we'll bring in the next crew. Is that because that's the way we've operated. So rethink and challenge and try to rearticulate the value of renewal that you have. Do you believe when people have time to renew that they are better workers? Have that conversation. And if so, then you can create policies and norms around working hours and renewal time. Do What's our value around time to think? Do we want to give people and expect people to spend time thinking deeply to solve the problems that our company faces? If we do, then do we put a limit? When in the day do we expect that? Do we want to align that? We want mornings for thinking and afternoon for interacting. Can we do that? Do we want to say we do not want to see anybody's schedule having more than 50% of their day in meetings? Because that's another thing that came out of the pandemic. Back-to-back meetings. People are in meetings from 7 a.m. till 7 or 8 p.m., If you have people in meetings back to back, where is the time to think and do the work that those meetings generate? The only time is at night and on the weekends. Yeah. When people are exhausted and need to recharge, that's when they're doing the deep thinking, when they're exhausted. That makes no sense at all. Do And then what is our meeting policy? What did we learn in the pandemic that will change our values of meetings? and the way we run meetings. And that maybe there's less meetings, but they're very specifically prescribed. These are the things we need about everything in person. These are the things that we can meet about on Zoom. And these are the things that we don't don't meet about at all. We just do emails or we just do memos. Or So I think those are the levers that uh, organizations should pull so that people feel um, supported to be doing the best work. 
I, I think it's a brilliant response. And I, I absolutely agree with the connectivity piece with the meetings. I mean, I think I'd like to think there's a bit of a global awakening to this problem post pandemic. I think we all immediately adjusted to work from home, what you know, marveled at the wonder of Zoom and MS Teams and other platforms that allow us to connect so quickly. We you know, get rid of the old face to face piece. We don't need it. It's more efficient. It's more cost effective. We can be anywhere in the world, which is great as we are right now. Yeah. And that was great yeah. at the start, but actually it's almost become the new email. It's it's the power of saying no and saying, actually, I'm not going to jump on Zoom right now. Organizing our diaries better so that we can't be in back to backs because they notoriously overrun as well, which puts the whole day back and everything then gets stressful. Um, but I th I'd like to think the world is awakening to the issue. It's whether or not we start to address that consciousness. And I don't know if, if even myself, if I, I'm aware of it now, but I don't know if I've done enough yet to redress the balance. And I think that's quite an that, interesting point. And the made. reason for that, and that's the biggest risk we have in this moment, we have, and I think everyone is aw awoke <laughs> and aware yes. uh, that we have an opportunity to reset, but what would stop us from doing it comes back to time and effort. It's not easy to think this stuff through. You have to invest the time collectively to like wrestle the, 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 these ideas to the ground. You're not gonna solve it in a 15 minute meeting. You're not gonna solve it individually. Rebuilding habits is hard work. And, but it takes time. That's why I think of time. Time is the oil in the machine of life. Anything you want to achieve, anything, from you want to work out and get healthy, you want to be connected to your family, you want to do a great job and innovate, or you want to reset and redefine the culture so that we are better than ever. We are attracting the best talent and we're setting them up to do such great work that they never want to leave. And it feels fabulous. We have to apply time and brain power to figure out what that looks like. And I think it's either laziness or fear or time that's gonna keep people from doing the thinking. I really sure. encourage leaders to hang in there. Don't, listen, there's a lot of work to do. And it's like, we don't even have time to figure out these problems. Let's just go back to the way we were, big mistake. Just create a committee and the things that I have both observed and heard and read and seen is, first of all, simplify the task. I just mentioned three key levers. What's our values around renewal and time, you know, recovery time, our values around thinking and our values around meetings. Those are the three big ones, right? Let's just focus on our norms around that and our values and our norms and put a committee together. And the committee, what I have heard over and over and seen is if you think of it as a one year renovation instead of a one month or one week or one meeting renovation, <laughs> And you pull from surprise corners of the organization. So don't just have it senior leaders leading this committee. You pull people from every division or every job category and every type. And so there's full representation. And you say, look, we want by the end of the year to have some great policies that really work. Let's have a starter for September. And let's meet in December and see how it's going and adjust and meet in March and see how it's going and adjust. People will respond to that. That's what I have observed is when you pull in the, organ, the, the, the employees, it helps. But you have to make sure that the mission of that group is not is to come up with policies that don't just serve the employees. Yeah, sure. It serves the organizational goals, right? And that's where companies have to make sure like, it's not like, oh, we're just making a cushy place for our employees. We want to win as a company. Sure. So, And as we know, we get good reactions if we rejuvenate, we recover, and we renew. And I think ultimately, if we don't start doing these things that you recommend, be it committee or recognizing these issues, like anything, I, mean, I don't know if it's, if it's just me, but on Zoom in particular, I find it very exhausting. I don't know if it's the intensity that we look at the screen or whatever it is, but eventually if we don't adjust, something will break. And if we, something breaks, whether that's mental health, whether that's you know people leaving due to attrition, whatever it is, something will break and it'll be too late then um, or be much harder, shall I say, to recover. And as you say, if we recover now, it's, it's much easier for people. I think one thing that I've seen all HR leaders, and in fact, leaders in general, they sometimes struggle. We've talked a lot about this time management piece and HR professionals in particular, they're very, very time stretched. You've talked a little bit about how we can recalibrate 
the, the, the screen related time and some of the email related time things. But what are some of um, the, the things we can do if we want to become that time leader champion within an organization? If I'm an HR director who goes, you know what, I'm going to take it upon myself, post this podcast to be that time leader in our organization. What are the, what's the first step you recommend they should take? Maybe it is that setting up of a committee. I don't know. That's one thing. I think to be a time leader, listen, I define time leadership as creating an environment that brings out the best in yourself and those around you and others, right? Peak performance in everybody. To be a time leader, I think you want to start with time leader of self, which is how am I managing my time? Get a grip, put edges on your own work day, try to break your email habit, build in renewal. Um, and always look ahead. I think that's another strategy that if you end every day by looking at tomorrow plus two, three days, arc always, what's on my plate? What should I get rid of? What do I need to make space for? Am I prepared? Always looking before you jump into the next day actually keeps you on task in a way that if you wait until the morning doesn't. But to the time leaders that I have worked with, that I've dubbed time leaders, HR leaders, people, officers, L&D, they recognize that time management is a, is, a, is a life skill that supports the entire infrastructure. And they spearhead the adoption of a common language around time. And they don't look for a single intervention. True time leaders recognize when we're, not, when we're brought in by true time leaders in the, those positions, they bring us in have us speak to introduce ideas, and then we do webinars or workshops to build skills in small groups, and then we do coaching to reinforce the, what people learned in workshops. And when you combine those modalities, and it's not just a one hit, sure. everybody knows you're serious. Everybody feels like, wow, this is not a fly-by-night, okay, everybody manage your time better, but we're going to really skill up individually and collectively. And, we, and they, they, they recognize your commitment and they make the commitment and there's just reinforcement, reinforcement, reinforcement. And then you get collective habit change. When you get collective habit change, it's unbelievably powerful. You know, then your group can, they move like the wind, they have common language like, oh, I'm in the middle of legato work. <laughs> and then everybody's like, oh, I know what that means. I'm not going to bother you because you're about to like solve the world problems for our company. So they have a common language. They're able to like expand or contract teams very quickly. People get onboarded in. This is the way we work. We talk about legato time. We talk about edges. We talk about renewal. This is how we operate. And this is how we all give our best to the company, to the team, et cetera. It's that longer term solution that actually I, I would say is what true time leadership is. Yep. I'm hoping maybe this podcast will be that first step towards the individuals listening to this becoming those time leaders within their organizations, because I think everyone would agree if we get that, that algorithm right, that, that process right, it can have huge potential benefits for business, for staff well-being, for productivity, for strategic thinking, and all the things that you've referenced today. It's something I think I could talk about for hours, but something I don't want to miss before the end of this podcast. I think it'd be really remiss of me not to ask or to ask you some questions about your fantastic best-selling books. There are so many of them, and I will put a list of all your books in the episode notes for anyone that's interested in finding out more. But in particular, I'd love to ask you a little bit more about uh, the book Organising from the Inside Out and Time Management from the Inside Out, which I know are, are related. If you could just tell our listeners a little bit more about, about those books and what we could discover if we were to, uh, to pick one up off the shelf. Sure. So Organizing from the Inside Out is my kind of flagship book on the whole process of how to organize anything based on the unique way you think your natural habits and goals so that that system is sustainable. It focuses primarily on physical space, right? Any form in your home, in your office, your filing system, and it also how to uh, organize when you're not the only one in the space. So how do you organize <laughs> when there's other people using the space? So that is organizing from the inside out. It's been translated into, I don't know, how many different languages all over the world. And it's really kind of become the Bible in many ways for the organizers and people globally and how to 
set up a system that will last. I read a great review from someone about that book who said that they'd taken it to such the nth degree that even reorganized their refrigerator, they'd reorganized their freezer, and they'd brought this the, the, the philosophies in your book or the, 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 the system in your book to the nth degree. And they were just inspired and they felt they had more time for everything in their life. Everything had its place. But I loved it when I thought, God, my refrigerator could do with a little bit more organization and my freezer in particular. And I just thought, wow, that's... That's that's inspiring for me just to read those elements because I know it's something I could take into my life. I just I know it's not work related necessarily, but I guess you take this into all walks of life, right? You do. And you know what's so interesting is that it does affect you at work because when you're at home and your fridge is organized and your freezer's organized, what happens? You eat better, you yeah. feel fantastic. When you get home, it's quicker at the end of the day to like throw a meal together. And like, we are one ecosystem. When I said managing your energy and brain power for peak performance, that's like, does your space energize you? Can you find what you need when you need it? Can you move quickly from work to home and home to work? So it's all connected. And it is so, and the fridge and the freezer are one of the a great first project because it's so contained. You can get it done in two or three hours tops. And it's a great place to learn how to organize because whatever you did in that fridge or freezer, you can apply to your living room, your family room, the kids' room, your closet, your office, your files. So um, yeah, it's very sad. It's, it's amazing. And I started with physical organizing. And as you said, once you organize your space, you free up a lot of time. And then you have time management from the inside. What do I do with all that time? Well, and that's a whole life. That's um, a good problem to have, all right? It is a good problem to have. And time management from the inside out it, it is it focuses completely on time management, on that closet metaphor. Change the way you think about time, and then how do you then? What do you want to put into the closet of your week? What are the big buckets? And it's a whole life approach, and you can customize your days should be filled with the things that energize and fuel you. Fantastically mm -hmm. reviewed, and as I said in my introduction, they've been there referred to by some amazing uh, publications and shows out there as well. So I do recommend everyone takes a look at the episode notes. There's links directly to the books there. You can find your own copy, and uh, please do let us all know at the podcast what you think of those books as well. Opening the L and D vault. Just to finish the podcast, if I may, um, do we always ask some very short, sharp questions, which is in our HR l and vault. So question one, in hindsight, what is one thing you now know that you wish you had known when you began your career? What I've really come to learn is that it is really about setting people up for success. It's not about teaching people the right way to do something in a way which is very task oriented, but that when you delegate the people really want to succeed. So you want to set them up so that they can like win. They can like come back to you and give you something. You're like, that's great. <laughs> that's about really positioning people for success. And there's a lot of techniques around that. It's a little mindset shift. Super. If you can give one piece of advice to the world to help everyone become more organized or productive, what would it be? I think know that getting organized and managing your time are truly learnable skills and start with one change that feels like it would have the biggest impact. Very often it has to do with self-care. Start Super. with self-care and everything else will follow. And last but not least, do you believe humans are becoming inherently more organized and productive or less organized and productive? Wow, what a great philosophical question. I would say that humans in some way haven't, they haven't changed. I think people like gravitate toward procrastination or order and that has not changed. What's changed is the world around us. And I think the world around us has become more and more chaotic, more and more unpredictable. And it's more, uh, that's what's changed. So our desire and drive to Get control is higher than ever. Couldn't agree more. Julie Morganson, it's been an absolute pleasure having you today on the HRLD podcast. I will, of course, put links to your web website, juliemorganson.com, juliemorganson.com forward slash books. Have a look at those titles, but I will put those in the episode notes as well. Um, are there any other links you'd like me to share while we have the opportunity? 
Yeah, I mean, I invite anybody listening who's interested, you can reach out to me and connect to me on LinkedIn. And I post on LinkedIn uh, as well. So that's a great way to connect. Super. I'll put your LinkedIn profile on there as well. So please do reach through to LinkedIn on our episode notes. You can go straight through to there to Julie's profile. And of course, if you're an HR L&D professional listening to this podcast and you have an HR related vacancy that you need some specialist support with, please do give myself or my wonderful team a shout. You can go to www.jjrecruitment.com or give us a team on 01727 800 377. Thank you all for listening. I hope you've enjoyed this podcast as much as I have. I've got loads of takeaways. It starts tomorrow for me the first hour i am not checking my emails julie thank you ever so much it's been an absolute pleasure thank you it's been delightful thank you so much for tuning into the hr lnd podcast with your host nick day ceo of jga recruitment specialist hr recruiters if you need any help with the current hr or lnd vacancy then please get in touch with nick and his team all contact details can be found in the episode notes In the meantime, to make sure you never miss a future episode, please subscribe to the show through any of your favorite podcast channels. Till next time.